So good evening and thank you for joining us yet again for another conversation with Flon. But as all of you know, it's not really a conversation with Flon. It's more Flon talking to experts who answer your questions. We've looked at your questions, we've given them to the experts and they will be answered. Um, and we are exceptionally honored to have all of these doctors here with us. Um, we know these are the busiest people right now. So for them to take their time and come and have discussions to educate the public, I'm extremely grateful for. Um, so I'll start with the introductions quickly. We've got uh, to my right, Dr. Ellison, who's a um, cardiologist. And then I've got Dr. Dashirwa, who is a neurologist. Dr. Kashitai, who's a specialist physician. I've got Dr. Titus, who is a medical officer at State and who's also a long COVID survivor. And then I've got Dr. Amrulu, who is a medical superintendent at Karatura Hospital, and she's also a obstetrician and gynecologist. <laughs> We're laughing because I was saying I'm going to hash the obstetrician, but apparently I can get it right. Um, so we're going to get straight into the discussion. Um, and before we go on to long COVID, there is a question that has been burning a lot of people, um, and we're seeing it, we even saw it on the front page of today's, uh, one of today's daily newspapers, where they were speaking about traditional leaders uh, uh, losing their lives to COVID. We're hearing the same about religious leaders. We also know that there's speculation in certain communities, um, one being the Ovahedero community, a second one being the colored community, that there are certain people more uh, predisposed to COVID fertilities. Now, for everything that we speculate on, there's a medical reason. And that's why we have specialists here to take us through the medical reasons, because I don't think the science is saying there's an ethnic predisposition um, to COVID. So it's, it's going to be great to have Dr. Kashitai to start off answering that question. Are there people more predisposed? What are the medical reasons um, for what people are starting to speculate that there are specific groups? Thank you, Madam First Lady. Uh, you know, uh, the, the first thing is actually that we, we need to, in order to answer a question like that, we need to look at the data. What does the data show us at? Because we're collecting data every, every time, when, especially with case management, where I'm actually saving on the national COVID task force. Uh, our data are not really pointing to a specific tribal group or specific individual being specifically pre-exposed to the extent of actually being much more vulnerable in that extent. Uh, it's, 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 it's rather pointing, the data which we are having is actually that they are pointing to certain clusters of individuals. And those certain clusters have got specific characteristics. They are either in specific professions like ours, healthcare professionals, we have actually had data which is now clearly showing that a lot of healthcare professionals are picking up COVID more than anyone else. And they're also obviously ending up in hospitals more than anyone else. And in terms of the numbers, they're also among those who are also dying from COVID. But we also need to look, and this is just the mere fact that they are actually heavily exposed. They come in contact with individuals. If you can imagine certain, certain colleagues of us spending the whole day in an intensive care unit, which is full of patients who are having active COVID. So that is the one thing. Those, that is that cluster. And another cluster of individuals are actually individuals who are actually working in certain sectors, like, for instance, in the banking sector, where, and, and the main reason is actually that in the banking and in the mining sectors, where they are actually working in very close confined environments. And those close confined environments are actually creating a better breeding ground for COVID. We all talk about uh, COVID being actually being spread by droplets. We, we, by now, every one of us actually knows that COVID is actually everywhere in the community. I mean, we, at the beginning, we're talking about sporadic infections, infections, but now it's actually a community thing. So people don't really know where do they pick it up. And that's the same thing. I mean, people, for instance, who are working either in the banking sector or similar type of situations, they have got contact with different people who are coming from different areas. And since this thing is actually already in the community, they will actually be heavily exposed. And not only that, the fact that 
the, that they are finding themselves in close confined uh, environments where they've got to rely on, 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 on air cones. Those air cones actually make, th make those droplets to spread easier. And that's the same thing with people with, for instance, in church leaders. Church leaders are also much more prone to that because they are in churches. The areas is actually very close, confined. And at the same time, because this thing is in the community, they are exposed to many different people. And that's the same thing. Same thing actually applies to, to our traditional chiefs. They have got to, they have got their consultants and the people with them they are talking, and they have got the community which they are actually serving. So they are coming. They are getting much more exposed to these individuals, and it's also no wonder that they are actually getting there. And then obviously, if you look at gatherings such as funerals, it's clearly at funerals people are much more closer. COVID likes it. COVID likes it at the place where there is no social distancing, where there is big numbers of people actually coming together, big numbers of people even being singing, being very emotional, screaming. This is basically what actually spreads COVID around. And if we can actually learn that these are the things which are actually contributing to, uh, to COVID, being, being in very close, confined uh, areas with big numbers of people gathering together, that these are the things, these are the real conditions which will actually allow COVID to spread. And then the other thing is also that when you go to funerals, you will see a lot. There are some people, many people who are actually doing their best now of actually putting up their mask, but are they doing it properly? Most probably more than 60% of them are not doing it properly. Many people in different places, whether it's now in, in various offices or even at, at such big gatherings such as funerals, their masks are basically at their mouth. Their nose is still exposed, or many of them are not even wearing it. They're just hanging it around. And when they are sneezing, when they are coughing, and when they are, when they are, when when they are, when when they are singing, those droplets goes around and they end up being circulated. So it's for you to put it together. Why do we think certain groups are more likely, more vulnerable to get it? Maybe it's the way how they have actually been doing things. We need to rethink our traditional ways of doing things. We know that there are certain cultures which have got specific ways of actually mourning their deaths. And we know that, I mean, talking about this specific environment of having close, close uh, confined environments where there's a big con congregation of people coming together, clearly that is not helpful for the situation of COVID. And that must actually unfortunately change because we cannot go on every time, basically from one funeral to another one, ending up losing people and ending up with people who a week after they have actually been at a funeral service end up with more infected people and a few of them actually succumbing from from this year we need to break this circle and the only way how we can really break it is actually if we can adhere to the simple principles social distancing uh, uh, using our masks properly and then obviously also sanitizing our hands but last and the least is actually that we are all crying for normality of our lives. We want to get our lives back. We are our children are actually fed up with this thing of the school interruptions. Young people who want to finish their degrees are also fed up. They want to finish their degrees so, so that they can actually go and continue their lifestyles. The only thing thus far which has actually shown to bring all these benefits is actually the vaccinations. We've seen it, what it's actually doing in Europe. Now they are using Europe, they, they are washing European cups and they are opening their bars. And that is basically that. And they have actually brought down all these restrictions which, are, which have actually been placed on us. At the moment, we need to deal with this here because we are among the 10 worst affected countries regarding if it comes to COVID. We're seeing more people dying we're seeing more infections coming on, and we're seeing an extreme limitation of our lives. If we can all, as Namibians, pull together and go for the thing which has actually been proven to be of benefit with these situations, we don't have time for any ex experiments. Try this remedy and try this remedy. The remedies which have actually been proven are talking for themselves. You don't really need to go anywhere else to look at what, what is actually working for COVID.
So I, so I think that's clear. The data is not suggesting that there are people who are more predisposed to COVID fat, uh, f fatalities. And I think what Dr. Kashita is saying, we must all adhere and all Namibians are vulnerable. Obviously, there are comorbidities and we'll go into a more detailed discussion um, about that. So I'm going to hand over to Blanche. We'll be going through the different um, questions that have been sent to our Facebook and our Twitter accounts. Doctors. The first question is to Dr. Titus, who is also a COVID survivor, just to tell our viewers what is meant by long COVID and to share your experience. So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a consultant and also the nation at large. So, um, before I was, before I suffered, I suffered from COVID and before I had long COVID, I was also a medical doctor. Uh, working in a COVID unit with very critical COVID patients. And around last year, after our first wave, we've noticed that there are a few patients that seem to have symptoms of COVID that last a little bit longer than the rest. So basically, long COVID is also known as long haulers. It is also known as post-COVID syndrome, and some of them also refer to it as basically back, so post-acute COVID syndrome. And it's basically when you experience uh, COVID symptoms, um, that have started either during your illness or have started after your illness, and it, and it tends to persist for at least longer than 12 weeks. And the symptoms, there's a long list, but they say most commonly it's patients that especially suffer from um, psychological symptoms, insomnia, anxiety, definitely. Uh, another important symptom that I still experience is what we call brain fog, where you sort of feel like you are forgetting things and you can't concentrate as well as you used to before. And then also experiencing uh, fatigue or when you are exerting or you are walking around, you are getting tired. And for me, myself, um, I was pretty healthy you know, or I considered myself to be a healthy young man up until I had COVID. And I was admitted in hospital and I was very sick. And then post COVID, what I experienced, one of the most common symptoms that I experienced, it's improving day by day is definitely getting tired when you walk around, especially it, at first it started walking around maybe f uh, short distances and then it improves gradually, basically. And then I, um, another symptom is also that I experienced visual problems also post COVID. And then third one is that I have been pre-diabetic since after my, my COVID diagnosis as well. So, I am still lucky, at least I didn't end up on oxygen for the next two or three months. But the symptoms is basically endless and especially the psychological aspect of long COVID, mm -hmm. not just for the patient, but also for the community and the relatives that have lost family members. And it's important to know, especially for the public, is that long COVID doesn't discriminate. It, it doesn't only affect the old people, those who had severe COVID, but also the ones who had mild disease. So uh, the other doctors, maybe to start with Dr. Amogulo, how does it uh, manifest itself, perhaps to explain from a cardiovascular point of view, neurological and also on the lungs, to be assisted by Dr. Shadirwa? Thanks for having me here. I think what is um, quite important, and I think the, 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 the data is emerging. There are a couple of um, studies that have been conducted, uh, mostly in sort of uh, North America and Europe, looking at the phenomenon of, of, of post-COVID syndrome, and also trying to look at the predominant symptoms. And as Dr. Titus mentioned, obviously um, fatigue uh, being one of them, sleep disturbances, um, uh, quite a lot of PTSD, and there were numbers that the, the, the study showed, up to about 30 to 40% of patients will experience some sort of post-traumatic stress disorder um, as a result of um, COVID. Um, neurologically, we know that headache is quite prominent, um, and either a normal headache or even um, sort of severe migraine-type headaches that do not uh, necessarily respond to uh, routine painkillers. And again, the numbers quoted were quite remarkable, up to about 50, 58% in some studies that have shown that um, up to six months patients can experience these atypical headaches. Um, 
the, the brain fog remains a problem. Um, and that is basically uh, a, a, a layperson's way of, of, of what we could consider sort of cognitive impairment following um, uh, um, COVID. And this is precisely as Dr. Titus mentioned, um, issues of concentration, memory, um, and remarkably also psychiatric um, um, manifestations. And um, one study conducted in Italy, for example, showed uh, uh, an, uh, a risk of about 18%, of up to about 18% of patients having had COVID with new diagnosis of psychiatric disorders, particularly sleep disorders and mood disorders, um, uh, specific depression. Um, so, yeah, th in terms of the neuropsychiatric manifestations, these are um, quite prevalent, and um, the rough and ready number you'd probably want to quote is between 30 and 40% of patients will experience some sort of neuropsychiatric problem over the long term. Um, the data is still emerging, unfortunately, and I suspect that given our more prolonged experience with COVID going on in the next one or two years, we may see this number either, either climbing most likely, and this is a great opportunity for us to actually look at these numbers and actually try and um, um, characterize it within our own population, because unfortunately, most of the data we have is actually imported. And um, as I said, this is a great opportunity for us to look at, at, at our own through population and, and characterize that. Dr. Ellison. Thank you, Madam First Lady. Um, and I think this is a wonderful forum for us to, to share ideas and to, to educate people and dispel a lot of myths. But I'd like to just highlight a few aspects uh, pertaining to the cardiovascular system in its broad sense, but more specifically then with the heart. Um, and obviously there is a complex interplay between what happens with the lungs and its impact on the heart as well. But I'd like to maybe just divide it into, into three groups. And the first is the at-risk population. And remember that if you've got comorbidities such as high blood pressure or diabetes, risk of having very complicated COVID is, is you know, 10, 15, up to 20% in certain studies. Um, so it's probably mediated through something called your, your ACE receptors. And we know that people with hypertension and diabetes and smokers as well, so there's coming through to that environmental aspect, put yourselves at risk from that perspective by allowing the virus access into your body. And ACE uh, receptors are particularly represented in the lungs. And that's the, uh, our weak point in terms of our, our protective aspect against COVID. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the vulnerability aspect. Um, in terms of acute COVID, I think there are two uh, areas where, where uh, the heart is affected. The one is a direct effect of the virus. And I think the, the most worrying aspect is when the virus affects the heart muscle, a condition that we refer to as myocarditis, and that's when the heart muscle becomes inflamed. And there's certain blood tests uh, that we can do to, to, to help diagnose that. But the uh, important presenting feature from a patient point of view is, is often with chest pain, and often it's not just the heart muscle, but the sac that the heart lies in that becomes inflamed at the same time. And one of the most important clinical features, which which you as the general public may be aware of as well, is if your resting heart rate goes up, and I'm not talking about in the setting of, of say, a fever or when you're anxious or agitated, but if your resting heart rate goes up relative to what you know your resting heart rate is, that should maybe be a concern that there is chest pain, uh, a manifestation of inflammation of the heart muscle. And then the second aspect is, COVID induces an inflammatory response from the body. You've heard of cytokine storms, and some people mount an excessive response, and that's mediated by certain proteins. You may have heard of things like tumor necrosis factor and interleukin-6. Some of those are targets for some of our medical therapy. But if that if inflammatory response is overrepresented, then certain inflammatory processes take place, and they do affect the heart, they do affect the lungs. Um, and that is important in terms of the, 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 the process. And as far as the post-COVID syndrome is concerned, here we're talking about anywhere from four to 12 weeks after the acute uh, manifestations have settled. From a cardiac point of view, shortness of breath mm -hmm. may persist. That, that should be investigated. Uh, not, not, not in every instance is it related to a serious condition, but often should be looked at because there are certain things such as clots on the lungs, uh, a, a pneumonia which may have not been detected, etc., that can result in shortness of breath. Weakness of the heart muscle uh, can also produce that. Uh, a persistent cough, and obviously isn't, there's an overlap there with the, with the respiratory system. And then what is well described, 
uh, in, the, in the long COVID syndrome are things like persistent dizziness. Mm. And there's a particular syndrome called, uh, given the acronym POTS, which stands for Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. It may sound like a long string of words, but it basically refers to the fact that with standing up, your heart rate increases disproportionately. And um, that has been well described in the medical literature. Um, I would implore uh, general practitioners to read a bit about it because it is a compensatory response of the cardiovascular system to possibly a degree of affecting the, the part of the nervous system which we can't control, the autonomic nervous system. Mm. But more importantly, a state of not having in, uh, sufficient blood volume. So you're a little bit on the dry mm. side. And if you then give these patients beta blockers, you can actually do them a great disservice. In fact, they often feel terrible by bringing the heart rate down because that increased heart rate is a, is a compensatory response. And that often improves with time, but it's, mm. it responds to lifestyle measures. Increase your fluid intake, increase your salt intake, graded exercise, um, and just slowly increasing what we call your vasomotor tone. So with mm. walking again, reconditioning the body, often that heart rate will come down by itself. And then maybe if I can just finish off by, there are well-established guidelines that in fact were published by the American College of Cardiology last year as to when people should resume exercise post-COVID. The last thing someone wants to do is to start jogging again where you may have had some inflammation of the heart muscle. And just as a rule of thumb, if you are asymptomatic, and a lot of us now in this third wave test positive for COVID, if you're asymptomatic, no exercise for two weeks after you tested positive. If you have min minimal symptoms or mild symptoms, you need to wait two weeks after your last symptomatic episode. And that means muscle aches, joint aches, fever. That's being on the safe side two weeks after your last symptom. So don't go start exercising if a week ago you had palpitation, so perception of an extra or missed heartbeat, just an awareness of your heart beating. And in the more complicated patient who has landed up in hospital, um, who's maybe landed up on a ventilator, they, they certainly need to see their general practitioner and possibly a physician or a cardiologist to do more sophisticated tests. And there are certain screening blood tests that we can do to look for clot breakdown, to look for inflammation of the heart muscle, to see if some of the hormones in the heart have been activated uh, by this virus, which may have impacted on the heart in a more serious manner. Um, doctor, just before we move on to the next question, as a follow-up, I just want to know, are the health facilities, Namibian local health facilities, equipped to deal with long COVID? Uh, to tell you the truth, probably not, because we're actually actively scaling up uh, facilities to manage acute COVID. The numbers are so many. We are converting normal wards um, to create bed space for the high and rising numbers of acute cases. So in fact, uh, cases of long COVID are probably uh, missed, are probably underestimated in terms of how many they are, simply because we're still doing a catch up in terms of trying to accommodate those that are newly and acutely being infected. So I even the, 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 the follow-up clinics uh, that should be in place for these sort of patients, um, we would have to do a lot of work in that regard. So maybe a, a direct response to your answer is uh, possibly not because we're still in emergency mode in terms of preparing for those that are flooding facilities currently with, with new infections. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Dr. Shadira, taking after taking vaccines and during COVID, many people complain of headaches. So you spoke about brain fog and PDSD. What does COVID do to the brain and why is this long term? Yes, well, the headache is almost ubiquitous. It's quite common after um, a vaccination. I mean, I myself can attest to that. Um, the, and, and so one shouldn't be overly concerned and it's probably on the basis of uh, the activation of the immune system that then causes the, 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 that initial headache that patients will experience after vaccination. But to try and answer your questions in terms of what COVID actually does to the brain, um, there are many reports, and there are fancy words that are thrown around, things like encephalitis, and et cetera, which is basically a fancy word of saying there's inflammation in the brain. 
Um, and anecdotally, yes, in my practice, I have seen um, about three cases of this, of patients presenting with COVID and the presenting complaint being just inflammation or confusion and funny behavior as a result of the COVID. Um, I must stress that this is a very infrequent presentation, so it's not something that happens a lot when, with COVID, but it does happen. Um, and on, uh, speaking on, on the sort of post-COVID syndrome, sure, the, 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 the cognitive impairment is a problem, and I think uh, most survivors of um, particularly severe COVID will attest to that. that it, it, it's a big, big challenge, and the patients just don't feel right. They have um, difficulty concentrating, and, and there are many theories as to what causes that, whether there's a low-grade fear, like inflammation that also affects the brain at the same time, um, or whether there's a bit of an overlap between the sort of psychological impact of having had um, a severe illness or even the psychological impact of having been hospitalized in an ICU. So, and that can sometimes be quite tricky to sort of tease out, is this more like a psychological problem or is there maybe just so sort of ongoing inflammation within the brain? Um, and there are obviously some useful tools that one can employ to try and differentiate between that. Um, but by and large, that's what you see. And then obviously the isolated cases of um, inflammation of the peripheral nerves causing a little bit of, um, uh, of paralysis. Although, again, in my experience, these are very mild, and patients tend to respond very well to treatment. So, again, not something one should really be too alarmed about. Mm -hmm. Just a follow-up, is there a specific age group attached to or being more prone to uh, feeling, feeling that brain fog? Not really. There are some studies that, uh, that, that pointed towards the 40 to 49 age group, although, again, the data is emerging, and I think it's too early to say definitely that there's a specific age group that is affected. And I think um, the, 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 the rough and ready answer would be everybody is generally at risk of developing this um, at this stage. That's what the data indicates. Okay. And Dr. Marulu, to be assisted by Dr. Ellison, what are the common myths and misconceptions on long COVID? How can state, private, and individual players counter them as well as other, other fake news? I think Dr. Kashitai can also come in there. Um, I, think, I think there are many, and they're probably related to general myths and misconceptions related to COVID in general. But I think specifically for long COVID, um, patients can uh, misinterpret ongoing symptoms for this is ongoing COVID, but it might be complications that are arising, a, a pneumonia that is a secondary uh, bacterial pneumonia that would be setting in. It could be a, a thrombotic event that could be setting in. And I think those misconceptions that I've had COVID and the specialists or the doctors are telling me that uh, symptoms are going to take weeks or months to resolve can keep people back. And, and, and prevent them from seeking care. And those are things I think that need addressing that should these symptoms present, should they persist, uh, seek care, get a proper thorough assessment and the diagnosis of long COVID is appropriately made. Because I think in itself, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. You've got to be able to say, I've excluded these other things for me to be able to say, okay, this is possible complications of uh, uh, acute infection and it's it's part of the recovery process so don't sit at home saying uh this is expected uh i'm afraid of ending up in katutura you know people have those conceptions uh go come be assessed and the diagnosis is appropriately made that this is indeed long covid these are the expectations and this is how you can be assisted to, to recover mm -hmm. yeah yes doctor yeah it's uh the Myths which are going around that is, I think these have cooled a bit down. The way they had it, they had these myths of saying that if you are vaccinated, there's some magnetic stuff which is actually being put into your body, and that magnetic uh, that magnetic stuff have got some uh, some sensors or some uh, some tools which can actually program you for after a specific period for certain illness and indeed actually even taking two years you might actually end up and 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 end up actually dying those were the those were that this this statement went there for a long time around there uh but i mean obviously you know when you're injecting someone with fluid 
you need to you you need to you need to know that for that stuff to happen there that a magnet is actually attaching there you need to have a lot of metallic stuff to stick on that so a lot of this year didn't really make any sense at all that things like that can actually go, get through that so you, you the the same stuff which we are actually using to take our animals for instance or the same stuff where we are using to to put in uh, depot provera and I mean some, sometimes long acting long acting oral contrac uh, contraceptive devices which we are actually putting in their bodies is actually almost the same type of equivalent which people were using and that obviously doesn't make any sense the other one which people a lot of people okay but this goes a bit more also on vaccinations that for instance, I mean, or also having having issues with uh, for instance with COVID as well. It's actually that some men are actually thinking that if they get COVID or if they end up with vaccines, they are going to remain impotent or they are going to struggle with uh, sexual competencies. This is also a very widely distributed type of thing, and you could actually possibly also put it in as a part of a long COVID or whatever it is. They have done researches. They have done studies which have clearly shown that, indeed, there is no sense in that, indeed, your potency on the longer run may actually also end up actually improving if you look at that. Because we had these discussions in another interview which we had with our health workers as well, and we pulled out the studies which could actually show that there is definitely no, no component. The main thing is actually that if you, if you had COVID and you thought you recovered, and now all of a sudden, after four weeks, you are developing these symptoms. This can be part of the long COVID, which people are actually talking about. But this can also be showing a serious illness, such as a pulmonary embolus, the, a condition which they call, which Dr. Allison called myocarditis, or even a stroke can actually hide behind that. So it's actually quite important also to go and seek attention for someone to go and do a thorough examination. It can also be that it might have been some medication which you have actually taken during the time when you were when you were having COVID. And some of those medications might actually also have long long standing side effects. We know that when we're treating people in our intensive care units, when they survive, having spent three weeks, for instance, on a ventilator, on a mechanical ventilation, having been given a lot of drugs to make them not to be aware of their surrounding the time when they recover, they usually go through a very difficult time. They actually, they actually develop a post-stress, uh, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome type of illness, which where they get very anxious, where they get very depressed, and obviously also then get also clouded as well. So all these possibilities are there. It's not just a, a given that oh yes, you are feeling this year, so you have got long COVID. Long COVID is, needs to be taken very serious for people to make sure that if there is a hidden serious illness which can be treated, that people can actually go for treatment. Now, Doctor, your response ties in with this question, which is that the concern on people staying away from general checkups, um, one is mentioned cancer here, will there not be an increase in long COVID-related problems and explosion of undiscovered cancers and other illnesses which are not being paid attention to now that COVID is being prioritized over others? Uh, you, you might be true in what you are saying. You know, when we as a national COVID response team, when we looked at issues, we, you know, at that time when we had our first wave, we, our numbers were very small. We, know, we knew these individuals by name. We had run about 30 individuals at the highest peak, and everyone was talking about these people. But, but, uh, but, but now we, we, we know that we cannot even know, name them. We don't even know who is that. We're talking about thousands of individuals. And, 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 and actually, do, do, during that time, we look at different scenarios. We had, we had the one scenario where, where we were still able to, where we were still, still able to to, to where, our syst where our system was still able to, to cater for hospitalization and services of normal individuals, I mean, and also with COVID not affecting the normal services. And then we had a situation where we were already at the maximum. We put them in, we used three, three colors. We used yellow, we used green, and we used 
we, 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 we use red. The green was actually where normal services could still continue. And then where the yellow was when we are coming close to coming to a saturation of our services, we are still just barely man managing to give our services. And then the, the red one was actually where we are no longer with our systems, talking about our, uh, our capacity to deliver health services in terms of the numbers of doctors and nurses, in terms of the numbers of hospital beds, in terms of the oxygen delivery capacity, the things which we need were actually overwhelmed. And we had different responses as well on that. And that's what you are most probably also picking up from outside, that you can no longer just go for elective operations. If you had, a, if you had for instance, a leg which was actually broken or you are working school, school, you cannot just go to the hospital and get that leg now fixed. Or you want to get a plasmatic operation or cosmetic operation, you cannot just go there because at the moment, any hospital doesn't have the capacity, not even to talk about increasing the risk of actually putting you there. So obviously, in the state sector, we've also closed most of our outpatient services because of this year, because now what we need to have is we need to have every specific healthcare worker to deal with the current situation because the numbers are actually overwhelming and our facilities are actually overwhelmed. So for sure, this is maybe the trade-off that you will actually, some people who might have had some cancers, who might have developed some cancers, might actually be delayed to be picked up. And by the time when this COVID wave has actually gone, gone, gone down, let's say three months afterwards, the disease might have actually progressed to such a uh, state that they cannot be treated. But unfortunately, these are the gifts and takes. At the moment, our focus is actually to deal with this paralyzing illness or uh, sickness which is actually going on that, which is actually crippled or which is still crippling a lot of sectors of our lives and we need to deal with it. So there is, there is a specific sacrifice which we are making and that might be that. But fortunately, if you're looking at the numbers of people with cancers and those things, those numbers are most probably not going to be so much. So the harm is going to be there, but it's not going to be that extensive. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dr. Allison. As long as the uh, incumbent acute problems are still taken care of, there will be an opportunity to play play catch up going forward. But I mean, that's you know that's it goes to say that uh, you know patients who still present with acute abdominal pain or bleeding episodes are taken care of. So those will continue to happen in the face of the of the COVID pandemic, uh, and that's why emergency care facilities continue to function. Uh, we are not doing elective procedures to allow staff and to allow our wards to be open up for, for COVID patients. But there still is that subset of patients who will come in with traumatic episodes, uh, acute appendicitis, patients who are still uh, having babies, etc. So there is an aspect of normal life that will need to be attended to. And I think in terms of the, the screening uh, programs from mammography, from doing pap smears, from men going for their, their, their prostate examinations, etc. Although those can be put on hold for a, t for a period of time, they, you know, they, there will be a time where we're going to have to say, look, you know, we, need to, we need to up these screening programs because it can't be on, put on hold indefinitely. Um, you know, but saying that there are certain patients who uh, are currently sitting at home, for instance, with an early diagnosed cancer, and those patients fall into a bit of a gray zone where there will have to be allocations for uh, them to continue receiving their, their, their treatment, whether it's from a, an operation point of view or receiving radiation therapy or chemotherapy, et cetera, um, you know, going forward. Because those are, are instances which really can't wait until the third or, or possibly fourth wave um, have finished. Mm -hmm. um, this question always comes up, Madam First Lady. It has to do with ivermectin. And again, this person asking, is it effective and, and the side effects? So yeah. And there's two elements to it. So I think the first element is what are the treatments? Treatment. People are always mm -hmm. asking, what are the treatments that are working? Should I be steaming? Should I be drinking? Which pill should I be drinking? And then Ivermedicin is always there. You're right. Always Blanche. there. So maybe Dr. Titus can start with the type of treatment that he got and then just 
um, give advice on what type of treatment is typically given to those experiencing severe diseases and then other doctors to tackle the ivermectin question. Okay. No, all right, thank you. So I think for the mild diseases, it's mostly supporter therapy. We do give uh, immune boosters. We also give uh, medications for headache, medications for fever, as those are very common symptoms. And then I think also other medications that we give is that for patients experiencing a, a coughing or so forth, we also give them uh, medications to help with that. So it's really supportive in terms of what is the patient's symptoms and how we can assist them with that. But also when it comes to mild and moderate disease is that especially mild patients If you can afford it or if you can borrow a pulse oximeter, it's a small machine where you can check your oxygen saturation. If you can afford to buy it or if you, if you have one yourself and you can borrow it to a friend, to a neighbor, please do. And then the, and then the other important symptom for me personally was that when you start trying to do daily activities and just walking from your bed to the bathroom or from the couch to the toilet and you are out of breath and you're completely tired, I think that's a very dangerous uh, symptom and worsening chest pain, definitely. And then obviously for severe disease, once again, we have our, su our su support of therapy in terms of oxygenation, if the patient needs it, and then escalating as the need uh, increases. So should the patient require assisted ventilation in terms of non-invasive as well as invasive therapy. And then... Um, yeah, and then the other important medication is definitely the steroids. I'm sure a lot of people have heard of uh, dexamethasone. We usually give it to our patients with severe COVID, requiring oxygen. There are trials that have shown that it helps. And then we also, um, to some patients, we also offer remdesivir with their consent, definitely. Yeah, and then if you need intubation, if you cannot cope on just normal face mask oxygen and you need to be escalated and you need to be uh, intubated or you need assisted ventilation, then it's basically that we activate a ICU type of, or ICU pr uh, protocol therapy. And we support um, you in terms of, if your blood pressure is too low, we support you with an certain drugs. There are patients that go into organ failure because of the COVID. Mm -hmm. And there are patients that also develop superimposed infections, especially superimposed pneumonia. So we also treat that. And then there have been a few patients that um, have developed renal failure. So the kidneys don't work very well because of the severe disease. So they might need dialysis. So basically we put them on a machine where we try to remove the toxins from the body, which is supposed to be the kidneys job more or less yeah mm -hmm. you just on that point you spoke about superimposed yeah. for a layman out there what does it mean so superimposed so basically what so you would just talk about the lungs um, so in simple terms is that when COVID um, attacks the lungs and COVID likes it loves the lungs because personally for me it started with a cough before I started experiencing loss of smell loss of taste and fatigue so because COVID attacks the lungs it also makes the lungs vulnerable to be attacked by other bacteria and other viruses so it just it just basically means that it's superimposed that on top of having the COVID you can also get another bacterial pneumonia in the lungs I mean infection in the lungs yeah. okay all right then just a short, short thing Dr. Titus why did you not use ivermectin? You are a well-educated person. You have read it. <laughs> and uh, you know exactly why I'm asking you that as well. Yeah. So, Sorry. So personally for me is that I haven't really seen the evidence that ivermectin works. And ivermectin is um, a drug that was designed to sort of kill parasites. And I myself, and I think a lot of people who have access to to the internet and there are quite a lot of uh, patient or public friendly websites on the internet and I went to before because I went to read about the side effects of ivermectin so despite knowing that there's not real evidence that it works and that it might actually make some patients worse this the side effect and the adverse effect profile for me personally it scared me because um, it can cause liver injury 
it can decrease the white cell count in your body. So when it decreases the white cell count, which are the, the blood cells that are supposed to help you fight infections, it can also predispose you to getting other infections as well. And then it also has obvious other side effects such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. People, some uh, people can experience um, allergic problems as well. So I think it was just mainly the side effect profile and the fact that I didn't find evidence that it worked. Okay, since Dr. Kashitai is also interviewing people, I want to ask him a question as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because there are doctors who are recommending ivermectin to their patients. And what do you have to say to those doctors? Because we tend to, we, we, we on these forums are telling people, listen to the doctors. Now there are doctors saying this. You're still dragging me, Madam <laughs> First Lady, you're still dragging me in the, on the spot. <laughs> you see, I was praying and hoping that Dr. Dashiro and Dr. Alison will take this question. <laughs> I know that there were following, follow on comments, comments were, which were made by very prominent people about myself and Dr. Sikuvi talking, making statements about ivermectin. You see, the, the, the reality of this disease is actually that there are frontline healthcare workers, there are frontline doctors, there are frontline doctors who are seeing the suffering of these patients. We sitting there every day with myself and Dr. Asikuvi and a lot of my colleagues here. We are going into the hospitals every day. We are seeing these patients who are coming with severe disease, who are fighting and gasping for air. We the ones who are giving these people oxygen and making plans to advance them to higher levels of making sure that their lungs are working. It's a terrible feeling to suffocate. And this is all what everyone is actually talking about. We seeing these people, and we seeing them to the extent that sometimes we put them to sleep, and then we put them on ventilators. It's not a nice thing to be on the ventilators. We are sealing this year. We are talking about experience, what we are getting here. You know, uh, COVID has made us to go at a higher, different level than what we were mm -hmm. overnight. It's basically the same thing like when HIV also came in here. There were not many people who knew anything about HIV, but because of the extent what it was actually killing people, the people had to become overnight experts. And we have unfortunately also been put on the front line. We have been having the opportunity to see, to witness and to see what is working and what is not working. Besides the fact that we are serving on national committees, which are completely independent, not political, motivated or anything like that, where we're sitting and taking the interests of the nation at heart and where we are bringing in treatments which are of benefit. There is, there is the pillar where we are actually sitting, which, I mean, man, which is na named the case management pillar, where, which is actually sitting with standard operational procedures, guidelines, which these guidelines have actually been taken from all the info, experience, the, the proven experience worldwide, be it now from Russia, be it now from China, or be it now from the Western world, we are using this year. And we are using guidelines which have actually been, been, accredited, uh, been accepted by international authori or author authorities. Now, the, what we have so far done is actually that we have been looking at all the information, the drugs, the way how this young gentleman was actually talking about all this information, which he, the way how he was treated, all the way how he was actually putting it down on the symptomatic treatment. You give them painkillers. You give them, when they are very critical, you give them dexamethasone. We can, I can quote your studies. I can give you names of the studies. I can give you a paper which is actually there. And I can actually tell you that this, these studies have actually been looked by credible evaluators who can actually say the way how the study was actually conducted was properly. It was not like one study is actually taking people. It's taking people, uh, a specific amount of people, but there are no controls. Or when they, are, when they are testing for the one thing to look at the efficacy and the safety, but at the same time, they are not controlling it with very clear placebos or whatever it is. It's things like this here. And from the existing evidence, what is actually at the moment there with uh, ivermectin is it's unfortunate. You can do your best to, f 
try to find credible evidence, but you're not getting that. I can quote you, I can tell you actually, recently the latest, lushest trial, which they use now, recently, I'm talking about it was published in the BMC Infectious Disease Journal of the, of the it was run about data the 5th July, and the South Americans tend to be using this drug a lot because they believe in that maybe we have got the communalities that they have also, it's also cattle country, the South, the South Americans, and maybe, you know, when you look at Argentina, when you look at Peru, and when you look at Colombia, all these studies, most of these studies are actually coming from those countries. And when, when they were conducting this specific study, they had to try to enroll a big number of people. But why? They only managed to get 500 people, 500 volunteers in that type of study, and, and the, out of 23,000 individuals, they only managed to do that. And why, what is the reason? The reason was actually that most of the people, over 12,000 12, people, were already on, who actually volunteered to participate in that study. They were already on Avermectin. And when they did that, they took these 500 individuals, they put them, they put half of them in the one group where they gave them Avermectin, and then they take another one, the 500, where they say these are placebo. P obviously, people didn't know what they were getting. And then they were following these individuals up in terms of the adverse effects and in terms of the prevention of hospitalization and the severity of illness. And they look at this, and, and they look at these individuals, around about 14 of these individuals who were on ivermectin all ended up in hospital compared to 20 individuals on the placebo group. So the difference in the numbers were not so big. But what, they, what, what the placebo group had was actually that they had more people who, had, who were at risk of developing severe COVID. This was, they had, they, they, they had more diabetics, they had more hypertensive patients. And when they followed these individuals up, they realized that four of those individuals who were taking ivermectin actually ended up on the ventilator, be requiring developing severe respiratory failure and requiring ventilation. And then on the placebo group, they had three who actually ended up requiring that. Yes, the, the ivermectin group only spent five days on the ventilator, whereas the people with the placebo had 10 days. But overall, the conclusion of that study was actually that, and this was the biggest up-to-date randomized study which was done on ivermectin. The conclusion was actually that there was no statistically significant study. There was another, I mean, a significant difference between placebo and ivermectin. In fact, there was no benefits which they could actually see. And then there's another study as well. I can actually talk about the Colombian study which I was think, done, which I was published. Dr. But Dr. this Ellison, is basically that I will leave Dr. it Ellison there. Dr. Ellison also has a, a study that he wants to <laughs> talk about. It, 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 was, it, it was with reference to the, the Ivacor ivermectin study, but I think... Uh, you know, just to make a comment about that is, in fact, the, if, if you look at it, and I know the numbers were small, but it's, it's, it is one of the first randomized placebo-controlled trials that we've got. You know, all of the, all of the data before that, that that are being quoted are based on meta-analyses, mm -hmm. and those have got huge statistical flaws. And, you know, it, it amazes me that there are almost a, 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 a philosophy of, of vigilantes, vigilantes out there who are advocating the use of, um, uh, of, of ivermectin when we don't have the data. And in fact, if you look at the Ivacor ivermectin study, in fact, the people using ivermectin did worse. So we've now got a study that doesn't just show benefit, it shows that the ivermectin treated group did worse. Um, and you know, this historically, if you look back, uh, this came from an Australian university. They had to give 100 times the dose of ivermectin to get an antiviral effect. We don't know how it works. D does it stimulate our immune system? It's very unlikely that it has a direct antiviral effect. And if you, if you look at international organizations like the World Health Organization or the Center for Disease Control uh, or the National Institute of Health, Ivermectin does not feature in any of those trials because there has been that concern. And uh, Medical Protection Society from Southern Africa today issued a, a statement saying that based on the Ivacor Ivermectin uh, study, um, there is a liability component for doctors who are prescribing Ivermectin. As it stands, it's a Section 21 drug, which means that if you're prescribing it, you have to see the patient face to face. You have to explain to them the risk-benefit ratio. And if you're not doing that, then you are 
you know, potentially legally liable for the complications that occur. So there is a, a downside to ivermectin. There's, there's no doubt about it. If I can just go back to, to one of the aspects, though, that's also very important, is that although we covered a lot of the aspects of treating uh, uh, relatively uncomplicated COVID and the more complicated COVID, there's a vast spectrum of increased risk of clotting. Yeah. And that clotting risk uh, occurs during the acute episode but it, it persists for afterwards. I mean, in my own practice, I have unfortunately seen tragic incidents of people having strokes, people having heart attacks, people having clots in the arteries and the veins of their legs, people having clots on their lungs, pulmonary emboli, for three to six months after COVID infection. So I think what is fundamental is that for uncomplicated COVID, patients should be on an antiplatelet agent, something like aspirin. As soon as they admit it, they get Clexane and Oxaparin, they get an injection or, or possibly Zerolta, which is almost like a tablet equivalent. And the duration of that is very dependent on how sick you are and what other risk factors you've got. But it is a concern that there is a direct viral effect on the blood vessels, but because of the inflammatory response, that prothrombotic risk, that risk of sticky blood, persists afterwards. And um, I think it also spills over into, if you look at some of the risk of the vaccine, and I, I will reiterate, it is a tiny risk. I mean, if you look at the risk of clotting on the AstraZeneca vaccine, it's one in 250,000. I mean, your risk of getting a clot from, from COVID itself is probably 16%, mm. and that's a conservative estimate. Mm. So, so, yeah, so you know, my recommendation, and, and I do individualize on a patient-to-patient -patient basis, is that if you're at low risk of bleeding, take, take an aspirin, a mini aspirin, mm -hmm. so in the form of Ecotrin 81 milligrams or aspirin CV100, and use it, I think, for the duration of your vaccination period, until you've had your second dose and for a month afterwards. For that long. For, yeah, I would do that, because it's going to minimize your risk. Yeah. Certain high-risk individuals are either already on blood thinners or may, in certain instances, need an escalation to uh, a, a blood thinner such as River Roxaban, Zerolta. Yeah. Um, and I think that needs to be discussed with your 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 doctor, your doctor, but it is a concern to me that the risk, and, and, and I, I can tell you, this does, it doesn't feature in any international guidelines, but it is a concern that the risk of clotting mm -hmm. persists for quite a while afterwards. Um, and the only other concern which may have come to the fore, and it's more related to the Pfizer vaccine, is that in Americans and in, in, in Israelis, a very small subset have developed some inflammation of the heart. Mm -hmm. It's a minor thing. It has resulted in two patients being admitted no mortality. So it's a very minor complication from a vaccine, but relative to the disease itself, you've got to weigh up in every instance what is the, what is the benefit yes, yes. compared to the risk and individualize. And I just want to quickly mm -hmm. jump in there, um, and especially with Dr. Amarulu, who's a gynecologist as well. So we were given the same advice by the same doctor about blood thinners not exercising, which we've taken, and I'm currently on blood thinners. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think what I didn't think about, and which I think more awareness should be made for women who still menstruate, um, the impact of blood thinners um, for their next cycle. I think if you can just take that through, because I think a few women are in for shocks when they go into their next cycle.